this is a little story about my grandma who turns 85 um, two weeks from now. Um, happy birthday, Grandma. She's a Jehovah Witness, so she doesn't believe in birthdays. So, happy birthday anyways. <laughs> so we were driving home, and you could see the fire trucks from two streets away. As we got closer and closer, it became evident that they were before our house. Everything I cared about was in that house. My grandma was home when I left. I didn't know where my brother was or where my mom was. It took me a minute to actually realize that my father had stopped in the street. I was simply observing my panic. My father, who my friends called Lion King for his monotone, deep African voice and stoic behavior, was like, hey, dirty, stop hollering in my ear. <laughs> Calm down. And just cruised towards our house. Outside stood my grandmother. She was in her winter coat and was crying. We bombarded her with questions. What happened? Where was my mom? Where was Urias? Before she could even answer, the firemen came out to tell us there was no fire. It was cold. My dad had turned on the heat and hadn't cleaned the filters, which created a smoke cloud in the house. The mood quite quickly changed. My dad, in his mechanical way, started to explain the purpose of filters to my grandmother <laughs> and apologized to the firemen, explaining that my grandma had just come from a tropical country and didn't have to deal with that nonsense. My grandmother, now embarrassed, simply looked at us and said, I thought I'd brought my bad luck on you. My grandmother had lost everything multiple times in her life. One of the early times is when she was um, married to my granddad, who was a judge and married her only at the age of 17. He died five years later, leaving her with three kids all under the age five. She was always trying to outrun poverty. Right before she came to live in America, she was trying to run for her life. As the rebel forces surged on Monrovia, Liberia's capital city, she barely made it out on the back of a pickup truck across the Cote d'Ivoire border. It was 1992, I was 12 years old, and my grandmother and I shared a room those first few years. Every night before bed, she would tell me stories about Liberia, about Monrovia. She'd tell me about the house she'd been building for five straight years. Every time she got a little bit of money, she put another brick down. She'd tell me where she's going to put her sewing room and where she's going to put the porches. She talked about the garden. Some of it had good soil, or you could plant vegetables, and some of it was sandy. We plot out ways to get to Aunt Lena's house and Uncle Harold's house. She talked about the vendors in the market, which ones were stingy and which ones gave you dash, a little bit extra cloth. All the while, Liberia was burning. Even as a child, I could tell from the gruesome images coming out of the country that the Liberian, my grandmother's imagination, was not reality. I didn't know if she was just simply mourning or nostalgic for a home that she would never have. It took me years to realize that what my grandmother was actually doing was memory banking retaining the value of her home and her memories. So now I'm based in Detroit. I'm working on code enforcement and revenue collections in the law department. It's dry, even for people in my field. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's necessary if we're going to address the insurmountable amount of blight in the city, 80,000 vacant properties, 40,000 of which are considered dangerous, which means that they are identified for demolition. Demolition doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation in Detroit. It's actually seen as a tactic in which we can address the cancerous spread of blight. The approach has actually been very data-driven. It looks at quantitative measures, such as vacancy and market value, and seeks to layer them on top of each other to identify places that are worthy of investment in residential housing.
It was this in my mind as I entered a meeting in Southwest Detroit. As you can imagine, these meetings are incredibly heated. So being my father's daughter, I was armed. I was going to talk about revenue collections, garnishment of wages, drown them in the dryness. I was the third person to speak. First, it was someone from the Office of Administrative Hearings, someone from Buildings. I thought by then they would have been promised or secured anything that they needed from the city. But as they began to speak, I realized that residents, they didn't care what we had promised or what we had done. They started to talk about their communities and the places where they lived. They started talking about properties that were long gone. They'd been demolished ages ago. They started talking about things that I couldn't solve, that I had no resolution to. And then they started talking about their neighborhoods. They started talking about how when they were kids, they used to cycle past these stone front houses and dream of owning them. And about the people who used to live across the street and about the gardens. They were doing what grandma did all those nights before, retaining the value of their place, of their neighborhood in their memories. You see, I think the reason why so many of us bought brought into Detroit to help with the bankruptcy and restructuring and the turnaround are not necessarily doing what we need to do and being successful as we could be is because we have no memory of what Detroit used to be. Therefore, we have a limited understanding of what the city can be. I have a colleague back at the city. He works in the budget department, Kevin Hill. He's an amazing man, lifelong Detroiter, worked for the city for 20 years. He's essentially like a one-man greening of Detroit. He goes around planting trees and abandon, um, and abandon lots and along the boulevards. Sometimes they're stolen, sometimes they just die. Ask them, Kevin, why are you doing this? You won't believe what he told me. He's holding on to a memory from when he was just three years old. As a child, his parents moved on the west side of the city and he used to look down the street and see this amazing canopy of trees. By 1969, that was gone. Those trees were uprooted and those houses were demolished to make a freeway. But still yet, he's holding on to that image. Our memories are incredibly powerful. It's the reason that many people in Detroit have stayed. And if we are ever to actually turn around the city and make residents a part of it, we have to understand how we can make memories a part of it as well. Thanks.